Thank you for coming along. As I say, I'm surprised to see anybody um, because nobody quite knows whether we're allowed to go out or not and whether we're allowed to talk to people or not or how many people we're allowed to talk to, what we're allowed to say to them. Uh, someone left a comment on my YouTube video today saying, I, my son can't visit me at home, but I can meet him down the pub. So what I'm going to do for this video is go through in a few lines, well, line by line, not every line, but most of the lines, of Boris Johnson's speech last night. Did everyone see it? No. I saw it, I didn't bother. Turned off. We now walked in. You turned it off. I can barely stump looking at him. It is difficult to look at him. It's getting difficult to look at him. Um, but I have to say, some of the things he came out with last night are nothing short of bewildering and is shocking the right word? Orwellian. Orwellian, thank you. Who said that? Aaron, thanks. That's a, that is, it's an overused word perhaps, but on this occasion it's very much appropriate. So I'm going to go through a few lines of what he actually said. Apparently, I've just heard this on the way down, apparently Nicola Sturgeon is pushing for a UK-wide lockdown. Um, we may be, I think, facing a second full-on lockdown, and probably very quickly. And I said today, and I say it again now, we are in an abusive relationship with our government. This is abuse. If you can imagine a marriage, and just for the sake of argument, not, no offence to anyone, will say the husband is abusive to the wife. He will try and control everything she does, not allow her to see friends, socialise, speak to people, financially, make her financially completely dependent and hold financial threats over her, intimidate and gaslight in that this is your fault, this is all your fault, you're the problem here. You did this, I'm not, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm only doing this because you keep doing it. That's an abusive relationship. And that is exactly what the government and Boris Johnson are doing to us now. We are in a, an abusive relationship. So one of the things he said was, this is the greatest threat we have faced in my lifetime. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if COVID-19 is the greatest threat we face in our lifetime. I do know that the response to COVID-19 is the greatest threat we face in our lifetime. He also said that the, the disease has, destroy has caused havoc and destroyed economies. I would argue with that. I would say it is the lockdown that destroyed the economy, not the virus. He said in less than a year, this disease has killed almost a million people and caused, again, caused havoc to economies everywhere. We, every single one of us knows that, this, that the numbers we are given for deaths from this disease are not accurate. Every single one of us. And we have had doctors break rank and talk. We've had nurses break rank and talk. We know that hospitals have been empty. Where is he getting his million people from? No one asked him. The press, as usual, the press are just fabulous at holding the state to account, aren't they? Nothing. No questions whatsoever. Where are you getting that million people figure from, Prime Minister? Who are we talking about here? How can you casually tell us that a million people have died? We want to know. Who are these people? There's no answer. He won't be able to answer that. Because it's a figure they've picked off the top of their heads, perhaps. Again, Cause havoc to economies everywhere. No, it's lockdown and your approach that have caused havoc to econ economies everywhere. He then says, in March, we pulled together in the spirit of national sacrifice. We followed the guidance to the letter and saved thousands of lives. Again, very matter-of-factly stated with nothing to back it up. And again, no press to say, Prime Minister, how do you know we've saved thousands of lives? How, where is the evidence? Where is the statistical data to show that this lockdown has saved thousands of lives? 
Where is it? There's no press to, answer, to ask that question, and if he was asked it, he wouldn't give an answer. In March, we pulled together in the spirit of national sacrifice. With social distancing, we kept that virus at bay. I'm sorry, but people have not been social distancing. They just haven't. They might have obeyed the lockdown, but since, since we've been back out, we're not obeying social distancing. And I know he doesn't think that we are. It's absurd. I say this all the time. I have never seen anyone st standing two meters away from each other when in the pub, for example. Never. Or in the shop. I've just never seen it. It isn't happening. So he goes from telling us, this is, the, this is Orwellian. This is the abuse part. This is the part where he tries to be all nice. You were, you, you were wonderful. You were wonderful. It used to be so great. And then you buggered it up. And he does this in the same sentence. He'll tell us, we follow the guidance to the letter. We save thousands of lives. But too many breaches. Too many opportunities for, invis for the invisible enemy to slip through undetected. So he's telling us in one breath, you were great, you did what you were told, but then you didn't do what you were told, therefore this is now on you. If another lockdown comes, it's on you. In the same breath as telling us how great we'd been. He told us infections are up, hospital admissions are climbing, and this virus is no less fatal than it was in the spring. Is that true? Does anyone know if that's true? I don't, that's not true. It's not true. The death rate has collapsed. The hospital's admissions are climbing. Are we any doctors? Any doctors or nurses going to tell us whether that's true or not? Is it true? We were told that we couldn't go to the hospital for months. We can't get a doctor's appointment. We can't get a dentist's appointment. We can do nothing because we can't overwhelm the NHS. While they were telling us that, we were seeing these TikTok videos of nurses and doctors dancing around because they had nothing to do. That's how overwhelmed the hospitals were. And as far as I'm aware, that's still how overwhelmed the hospitals are. You're, you're nodding. Do you, do you know a hospital? Do you... Well, it... hospitals, because, well, up till two months ago, I was doing PPE deliveries. Right. And every hospital, Middlesbrough, <coughs> Darlington, Newcastle, Sunderland, all empty. They're all been dead since the beginning of this lockdown. So I don't believe that any more than anyone else in this room believes it, that the hospitals are in trouble again. They were never in trouble, and every one of us know it. The vast majority of our people are no less susceptible. That's not true either. The vast majority of us are not susceptible. Certainly not to death. We're not. This is, these are words intent intended to frighten us, but it gets worse. First of all, the new rules. Bars and restaurants to close at 10. Restaurants or supermarkets have to stop selling alcohol at 10. What for? What for? What is the difference between 9 and 10? Is the, is the virus, I know, I know there's a lot of jokes and memes and things going around, but is the virus really clever? Is the virus listening to Boris Johnson and saying, you know what, I'm going to listen to these rules now. I'm not going to infect anyone before 10 o'clock. After 10 o'clock, they're in trouble. This is utter nonsense. Crucially, this is what he said. We will be closing businesses that are not COVID secure. That's a threat. That's one of those threats I was talking about. Anyone who hasn't got sheets of plastic down the middle of their tables, or a one-way system to the toilet, or something, or one in, one out, some ridiculous nonsense, now faces having their business closed. And if they can't afford to put sheets of glass between every table in their restaurant or in their pub, they're in trouble, aren't they? They're going to be closed down. Expanding the use of face coverings. Even though we already know that face coverings don't do anything to stop this disease. They don't. And they're dangerous in themselves. It depends on the type you use. I find it difficult, very difficult to breathe in them. 
I really do. I on, and I only have one of these cloth things that I put around my neck. And if someone says anything to me or anyone looks at me in the supermarket, I'll pull it up for a second and just to, to fend off and then pull it back down again usually. I'm going to get to that in a minute, by the way, whether or not we should stick to the rules. But we're expanding the use of face coverings. This means I think we're actually supposed to wear them now. I think that's what's meant by expanding the use of face coverings. I, the supermarkets in Hartlepool, what are they, about 50% not wearing them, Graham? Uh, that's the 50% being targeted now. The fines have gone up from one to 200 pounds and repeated offenders are face a fine up to 10,000 pound. And with a figure like that thrown around, you're going to frighten people. They're going to get more compliance from this, I have absolutely no doubt. We were told last week, and here's abusive as well, changing your mind every five minutes so that people don't know where they stand. They don't know whether they're coming or going. It's bullying. It's a form of bullying. Being nice one minute, horrible the next. Nice one minute, horrible the next. It's my fault. It's your fault. That's bullying. And changing the goalposts every few minutes is also bullying. It's confusing. So last week we were told to go back to work. This week we're told to work from home. We were told on the headlines on Monday, I don't know if you saw my live stream on Monday, we were told on the headlines, the BBC does five headlines on coronavirus every, every night. One was greater restrictions in Wales, greater restrictions in Northern Ireland. Number one is greater restrictions in Wales. Number two, greater restrictions in Northern Ireland. Number three, restrictions eased in England. That's confusion. That's deliberate confusion. It has to be deliberate because even they can't be this incompetent. Can they? It's up for debate, I suppose. So we've been told to work from home now. The rule of six, which is six people. I'm not sure about the rule of six. Now, I have sat down and read top to bottom the government website on this, and I still have no real idea what the rule of six is. We're not allowed to mix and mingle with more than six people. That's, am I right? Is that the rule of six? From outside your household. From outside your household. So if you have... So if you have seven people in your household... The rules are adjustable for certain situations such as that. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. So if there's 15 of you live at home, fill your boots, all 15 years can... We're not allowed to stop and speak to our neighbours in the street. This was confirmed by Priti Patel on the radio. And then she was asked, would you report your neighbours to the police if you saw them chatting in the street? And she said, yes, I would. This is, this is our Home Secretary. This is, what, this is where we are. So the rule of six will be extended to indoors and outdoors. I don't know what it meant the first time. I'm not sure what it means this time either. And I'm not a particularly stupid person. If I can't figure it out, I suspect there are others who can't figure it out either. And they're facing fines for something that they don't even understand. It's abuse. Nothing less than abuse. It's a narcissistic wet, uh, narcissist's wet dream. It absolutely well described, Darren. That's exactly what it is. And I think we're dealing with narcissists here as well. Tougher local restrictions can be applied. He also said that. And what that means is... Your local council, filled to bursting with Labour do-nothings, who haven't done anything for years, who take the vote for granted and sit on their backsides vast majority of the time, they will decide whether or not you can visit your mum down the road. Them. They will decide it. Your entire life is in the hands of local councillors. Are you comfortable? So on top of all this, your local clipboard warrior, no offence Karen, I know you're, you, you, show them, you show them how it's done. But around here they're mostly Labour and we know what Labour councillors are like. He also said that these proposals, these changes are supported by every party in Parliament. That's shocking. No one is questioning him. 
There's no opposition from inside the House of Commons and there's no opposition from the press. We're told a million people have died. We've saved thousands of lives. You were wonderful, but you, it's all your fault. And we are, and no one there to question it. No one is there to question it. Every one of them in Parliament is A-OK -okay with all this. Here's, the, here's where the really scary, scary language comes in. This is when he was starting to wind down and, and said, a stitch in time saves nine. That's Graham reminded me outside. I love that. This is when he was starting to wind down. He said, your mild cough can be someone else's death now. You selfish, irresponsible killers. Just do everything we tell you from dawn till dusk or you are risking killing other people. That's the message. The suggestion that we should simply lock up the elderly and vulnerable is unacceptable. When he said that, the only thing that came into my head, and I actually wrote it down, and I wrote it down in capital letters. And no one's going to see it but me, but I wrote it down in capital letters because that's how furious. How dare he? How dare he sit moralizing about locking up the elderly and vulnerable now. They sent thousands of people into care homes with COVID-19, knowing full well it would kill elderly people and it killed about 30,000 more than did the deaths at the same time last year. And now he's gonna sit and moralize at us. They essentially murdered elderly people. And I'm not being dramatic, it's the truth. They knew what would happen and they did it anyway. They killed tens of thousands of old people and now he has the cheek and the gall to sit here, not here, but there, and blame us. Blame us for leaving elderly and vulnerable people alone. People, elderly people in this country starved to death during the lockdown. UK 2020, our elderly are starving to death because they're too afraid to go outside. And he now has the sheer effrontery to sit and tell us that we must protect the elderly and the vulnerable. This is devilish stuff coming from Boris Johnson now. Really, really rotten. He then said, we will enforce these rules with tougher penalties and fines of up to 10,000. We will put more police on the streets and use the army to backfill. This is the language he wants to frighten, and he will frighten. There'll be millions of people across this country last night listening to him absolutely terrified of what he's telling them because they trust him. They trust him because they don't have any choice but to trust him. He's the leader of the country. What choice have they got? If they don't trust him, what have they got? Who do they trust? Where do they turn? People don't want to acknowledge the fact that their leaders would do this to them, but they would, and they are, and they will again. And using language like, use the army to backfill, isn't it absolutely astonishing? If this doesn't tell you the real nature of all this, nothing will. We will put more police on the streets to keep you locked up in your house. For that, they can find more police on the streets. And they're gonna use the army to do police jobs like protection of buildings, protection of people. Things normally done by police will now be done by the army to free up the police. Why doesn't he do that for crime riddled areas? Why doesn't he do that when there are terrorists threatening us Outwardly, outwardly, we have thousands of ISIS terrorists in this country. Many of them not watched because we don't have the resources and the manpower. They shouldn't be in the country, of course, at all. But why can't he find extra police and bring the army in then? He doesn't want to. Of course he doesn't want to. He wants to keep us locked up with masks on and terrified and not able to speak to our friends or our family or have any social contact. He wants us to not be able to meet, to plan, to organize, no political rallies, no opposition, no discussion, no nothing that might help 
us. He's shutting it all down. But we have had catastrophe after catastrophe across this country for decades now. And there were no police. And there were certainly no army called in. What about Rotherham? Where were the police then? And all the other cases. No police. People burgled, mugged, stabbed in the street, no police. But now they can find police to keep you locked in your house, frightened, intimidated, lonely, isolated, and afraid. That, for that, they have plenty of police. And if they run out of police, we'll just bring the army in. Their priorities are absolutely obvious. Absolutely obvious. And by the way, the, the masks, the masks, this is not temporary. These masks are here to stay. Has anyone seen the ads for the masks? Oh, it's better. Your mask is your freedom, they tell us. 1994. It lets you, yeah, absolutely. Your mask is your freedom. It lets you get back out and reconnect with people. No, it doesn't. OK, so Boris went on to say, our NHS, if we don't do this now, whatever this is, our NHS will have no space once again. Once again, what? Once again, there is no once again. He's lying. It's a lie. The whole speech was one big lie. Then he goes on to try and guilt trip us again with saying that we won't have the space to deal with cancer patients and millions of often non-COVID medical needs. As if we've been dealing with cancer patients and non-COVID medical needs. How many people have died from this lockdown? There is no, there's no, the point is there's no weighing it up. He is taking advice from the same two people. He's been taking advice from since the start. It's time for a second opinion, Boris, because you're going to have to weigh up the pros and cons of another lockdown. And if you really do care, about people dying and the elderly and vulnerable being left alone, find a way that isn't a lockdown. There has to be a way. If Sweden can manage it, why can't we? He said, if people, oh, he mentioned, this part really got me as well. If we have a new lockdown, the loving human contact on which we all depend will be taken from us. Give me a break. If he cared about love and human contact, we wouldn't be in this mess. He then said, if people don't follow the rules, I like this, I made sure I wrote this absolutely accurately. If people don't follow the rules we've set out, then we reserve the right to go further. It's called emotional It's called tyranny as well. That's what it's called. Because it's a threat. It's an open threat. Do we say it'll get worse? It'll be all your fault. And reserve the right to go further. I think they've forgotten who's in charge here. And I think they forgot about this a long time ago. We are governed with our consent. And if you stop doing things that we consent to, we have a right to get rid of you. Your only power comes from our electing you. So don't presume to sit and tell us that you reserve the right to take our lives away from us just because we voted for you a couple of years back. It doesn't work like that. We must rely on our willingness to look after each other. You're not allowing us to look after each other. We must protect each other. These are the stuff, these are the things they wind down with. They try to end on a positive, active note. Here's what we need to do. We've just, we've just been through a, a, a litany of lies and abuse and gaslighting and manipulation. And then at the end of it, he, he signs off with, let's all look after each other, shall we? It is genuinely scandalous, genuinely scandalous. And I re rewound it and watched it again. And I thought, I cannot believe we are in this situation. I just cannot believe we're in this situation. So as for the economy, he will kill more people with another lockdown than the virus will. I, that's my, that's, 
an estimation. I don't know that for a fact because nobody knows anything, including Boris Johnson. Those figures are nonsense. You can start estimating it. You can take like the 30,000 from the care homes. You can, Godfrey Bloom somehow managed to get an admission from the government. I still don't know how, but 300 people in the non-critical died directly due to COVID. And when you add in the elderly ones, not the care home ones, but whatever, goes up to 2,000, so that's 2,000 at 50,000, so you've got like 48,000 left, so you're 30,000 from there, plus that, then you need to start looking at things like increasing suicides and various different things. You can start putting an estimate on how many people have died due to... Absolutely. And the thing is, the, the economic impact of a lockdown, the economic impact of the first lockdown hasn't even been felt yet. And how many people are going to die from that? In the longer, in the medium, long term, how many people are going to die? There will be much more suicides. Lots of people are going to lose their jobs, their homes. There'll be a lot more homelessness, a lot more suicide. It's, uh, he needs to weigh this up, and he isn't weighing it up. We have a situation where he is being told, and by the way, the scientists are, are arguing, his scientists, are arguing with him, the same scientists he's been using this whole time, are arguing with him saying he's not going nearly far enough this time. So they want a full lockdown and those scientists don't care about the long-term economic effect on the country. That's not their job. Their job is to tell Boris Johnson whatever it is they tell Boris Johnson. They are not taking into account the long-term effects and the long-term damage is people will be poor for decades from this, absolutely from decades. We owe more money than you could possibly count. We now owe over a trillion pounds for the first time in the country's history. How are we going to pay that back? How many of those scientists have got the finger in the pie of the vaccine? I brought this book along. Um, I'm going to show this to the camera. This is what I'm going to call this from now on, the Great Reset. This is a, I've not, I haven't finished it yet. It's quite a left-leaning book, sadly. But facts are facts, even when lefties tell them. And this talks quite a bit about the resetting of the economy to a environmental-based economy. And we can see that that's already happening. The green lobby is getting in there very much so to have a new, a new economy, a new start. And we all know that the green economy is a disastrous economy. More trees are cut down for, for green energy than... <laughs> I thought we weren't supposed to be cutting down trees. Now they're cutting them down en masse. We're also getting uh, electric cars. When last year, we were not last, literally last year, but you get my meaning, we were told to switch off the lights. Now we're making electric cars. We, the, use, the energy used to make these wind farms isn't even offset by the wind farm. It's a disaster. But a lot of rich people are getting very rich from it. So that's what they mean by environmental economic reset. This is what they predict in this book. But absolutely crucially, what they predict in this book is a complete transformation, a reset of the relationship between the people and the government. They describe it as the return of big government. Now, a big government is what? A big government is one that is in charge, top down. The state is in charge, not the people. The people fear the state and not the other way around. That's what big government is. It has its fingers in every pie in your life. Its tentacles are everywhere. Everything is regulated, strictly regulated, a bit like now. You're not allowed to talk to your neighbours walking down the street. That's regulation. We're urged to grass each other up to the police. My, but Pretty Patel, on one day, says, tell the police if your neighbours are talking to each other. Next day, Boris Johnson says, come together, let's protect each other, let's look out for each other. Which is it? They're dividing us. This country is so spectacularly divided already. 
We're divided down the middle still over Brexit. And the reason we're divided down the middle over Brexit is because Remain wouldn't accept the result. So we have families being ripped apart by Brexit still. I remember a friend of mine, she, her family wouldn't have Christmas dinner because one of them voted, she voted Remain and her brother voted Leave. And they wouldn't sit down and have Christmas dinner together. For the first time, the family didn't sit down together. Now we have people falling out over the Black Lives Matter fiasco. That's divided us as well, straight down the middle. Some people are saying, oh yeah, but black lives do matter. And you say, yes, I know, but this is, these are radical Marxists who are exploiting race, race, racial injustice, or whatever aspect it might be, in order to bring down the system and reset the world. And that's what we're getting. We're getting a great reset. Big government is not democracy. Democracy is big people, small government. A democracy, the government does what it's told and not the other way around. We know that there is a dislike for democracy in our House of Commons. We saw it after Brexit, same thing. So any chance to get rid of the power of the people, which is what democracy represents, what that <coughs> word is supposed to mean. Literally, the word comes from Greece, democratus, the power of the people. How to end a democracy is to take away the power of the people and to make statements like, we reserve the right to go further. That's the end of the power of the people. And how, have, how has big government changed? How have government got bigger since lockdown? Too, too many examples to tell. The obvious ones are obviously that they're telling us that we can't speak to our neighbours in the street. That's very much top-down control. But it's also that abuse thing comes in again. Made us financially dependent on them. That's what they've done. I, th I would doubt there are many businesses left in this country that are completely, small businesses, that are completely independent at this point and have no government money having been put into them. Very, very few medium or small businesses will have had nothing from the government in the last few months. Very, very few. What does that mean? It means they're dependent on the government. The government effectively owns a stake. It may not be legally, but it does. And that control, that's just a, a tiny step in the direction of financial control of this country. This book talks about how government is now unprecedented, has unprecedented involvement in what were previously private businesses. That's how they take control. And that's how they become big government. It's also how they threaten and intimidate us. They control when we can go out. They control who we can speak to. They have made huge mistakes and they blame us. They are openly openly cheating on us, in front of us. <laughs> this is where the abuse of relationship comes in again. They have no money for us. Sorry, can't have that, got no money. Times are too hard. And if, uh, if, the, if the abusive husband says to the wife, no, can't, can't do that, I know we need something for the house, but we can't do it, we've got no money. And then he goes out and buys a, a, a diamond necklace for his mistress, in front of her. That's what the government's doing to us. We have no money, but we do have money to take half of Africa coming across the English Channel every day. We have money to put them up in Swiss hotels. We have money to buy them phones and clothes and spending money and take them into town every day. But we have no money for you. That's abuse. And that is abuse and flaunting it in our faces. We have thousands of people sleeping in shop doorways in this country. They are putting strangers from Africa up in plush hotels in front of us. There's no embarrassment about it. There's no shame about it. They're doing it in the open while we watch. It's abuse. They are, as I say, they're, buy, they're buying gifts for other people while we go hungry. Another major aspect of this, of course, is going to be taxation. And that's another way governments make themselves very, very large and intrusive. And, take, and taxation isn't just a matter of taking more of a certain tax, 
but introducing more taxes. So they have more fingers in more pies, and there's more regulation, and they have more access to your business arrangements, and they have more access to your financial arrangements and your domestic relations, and they have more access to you. Your privacy eroded and eroded and eroded, and your money, the money in your pocket, eroded by taxation rises. And we know that this is already happening as well. This is what's been predicted in this book, how the government will make itself supremely powerful. And um, we won't be getting those, any of those powers back either, by the way. Taxation is another, and Rishi Sunak is now talking about raising taxes on businesses. The very people they need to keep people in jobs, to give people jobs, are now going to be harmed even more by tax rises. And while they take taxes from British business, while they take more money out of British business, what do they do? Hand it to a bus full of strangers from the Middle East or Africa, in front of us, while we watch. And this is all, any, any psychologist, psychiatrist will tell you what this is. It is psychological manipulation on a grand scale. Absolute manipulation. It is filling us, drumming fear into us, making us feel dependent, scared, and isolated, and then taking our freedoms bit by bit by bit by bit. They've been taking our freedoms bit by bit for a long time. And the worry I have, and the main worry I have with all of this, is that A, the people don't realise that this is what politicians, this is what governments can do. I'm not saying every government is malignant, but they can be. And when they are, this is the kind of thing that they do. It is psychological abuse, and they, tyrannical governments have been doing it to their population since the dawn of time. How lo for as long as there have been societies, governments have come along and abused their populations, just like this. My big worry about this is, one, we don't realise that we're being abused, and two, we will just get used to it. And the government expects us to get used to it and forget about what it was like before. You remember when they banned smoking in pubs? Everyone just got used to it really quickly. All of a sudden, going out for a fag became a thing. Everyone just accepted it and got used to it. We're already accepting the masks. And this is way, way bigger and way more significant than having to go outside for a fag. But we're already accepting it. And we'll get used to it. I remember Tony Blair saying once that he was talking, he wanted to bring charges into the NHS. And there was opposition in the Labour Party for charges in the NHS. And he said, along the lines of, I, I am paraphrasing, I can't quote him directly, but he said along the lines of, just do it, the people will forget that it was ever any other way. And he's right. People will forget it was ever any other way. We are walking face first into a prison state. I don't have all the answers on COVID-19, but I do know one thing. If I was in charge of this country, we would be looking at other options. We would be having other science. We would be looking at countries that are not locked down. We would be looking at countries who are in economic recovery, like, for example, China. China has done very well, thank you, out of all this. Very well indeed. And now it's on its way back up. We're in collapse. The entire Western world, apart from Sweden, it seems, is collapsing. And China's on its way back up. China's having a right, right royal old time. Any psychological abuse has to be... If you're in a psychologically abusive relationship, what do you have to do? You have to get out of it. And we have to get out of this one. And the first step of, you have to take to get out of an abusive relationship is to confront the truth about that abusive relationship. You have to admit what is happening in the first place. You have to acknowledge your problem or it will just continue. Now, our problem is very, very simple, but very, very harsh and very hard to hear. But we have to confront the realities of this. And the realities of this are that for the past 30 years, government after government have been openly 
attempting to completely transform this country. They've done it through mass immigration. They've done it through political correctness. They've done it through hate speech laws. They've done it through... Um, take your pick, take your pick. There, there are a million different ways that they have changed this country, mostly, mostly through eroding our free speech and mass immigration. And that, frankly, is enough. The truth, the harsh truth, is that they've been doing it for years and we have been letting them. That's the harsh truth. That's the problem we have to acknowledge. And that is not intended for anyone sitting in this room, but there will be people watching this video. We did this by continuing to vote for them. That's how this happened. And I could sit here and tell you, don't obey the rules. Let's all rebel. Let's all absolutely flat out refuse to do this. It's not going to work. People are too frightened. People are simply too frightened. People don't want a £10,000 fine. People don't want to get into trouble with the police. It's frightening. It's really, really frightening. And it would be very irresponsible to tell anyone not to obey rules that can get them stuck with a fine that they can't afford. I think it's for people's conscience themselves and what they want to risk as to whether or not they obey the rules. I don't generally, I have to say. It's up to the individual, as far as I'm concerned, whether or not they want to obey these rules. But even if you don't, every, for, for it to work, the entire 60 odd million of us would have to do it. And that's not going to happen. I admire people's courage who don't do it. But this isn't the solution. It's not a solution. I mean, you know what I'm going to say. I say it all the time. You have to get rid of them. It's the only solution. It's not what people want to hear. It's not dramatic. It's not ex a big event, a big exciting event. It's long. And leaflet delivering in the rain. And difficult. But it, it's the only option we have. It is literally the only option we have. No matter, we can have all the protests we want. They don't listen. We can sign every petition in the world. We can, we can have hundreds of thousands of signatures on a petition. They'll throw it in the bin. None of it matters until we kick them out of Parliament. None of it. We start with the local councils. We have to kick them out. It is the only option. Now, I, see this, I see this one way. We, have, we do have a choice. If we... No matter how despondent people might feel, and I understand that people feel despondent, I really do. You feel, people feel hopeless. People write to me all the time and say, there's no point anymore, it's over. This country's over. It'll never go back, it'll never be Britain again. And I do understand why people get to that level. Someone wrote to me today and told me that her friend had committed suicide over this. People are, I get elderly people particularly telling me I'm so, I actually want to go now because I can't bear to watch, I can't bear to watch Britain turn into some communist state. I can't bear to watch it. And these are the people who built it. And now they're saying I'd rather not be here, I don't want to see it turn into this. And I do understand how people get to that despondency. <laughs> Here's, the reality of it is that there's nothing else, no long-term solution to this except electoral politics. Nothing else is going to work. We can either, if we fight it on that level, if we fight it at the ballot box, as we must, we might lose. We might. If people say to me the country's gone, well, even if that, if that may be, I don't think it's true, but even if it, it might be true, so what are you going to do? You either fight, and it might not be true, or you don't fight, and it definitely will be true. If we fight, we might win. If we don't fight, we definitely won't win. And there's so much at stake. So much at stake. We have had a, just a, a country 
that has been vibrant and free and it's told its story and it's told its story for centuries and look look around this room that's the story I'm looking at a table on my table in front of me is in loving memory of Ron Tucker 9th November 25 to 25th of April 2018 some lovely photographs of him in his service uniforms all around here are photographs of people who put their lives on the line for this country and they didn't do it so that we can turn it in to some oppressive prison state with high-vis COVID jackets telling us where to stand and where not to stand over something that isn't even transparent to us. It wouldn't be so bad. It wouldn't be so hard to take if we actually had some statistics, some evidence, some reality that this is all real, but there isn't any. We're going from the hospitals are overwhelmed to the doctors have nothing to do in the same breath. We're going from grass your neighbors up to the police to look out for each other in the same breath. We're going from thousands of deaths today to there aren't no. The deaths were going down last week. Now they're up again. We don't believe you. I don't believe them. Frankly, I don't believe them. I don't believe a word they say anymore. They don't have a clue what they're doing. They are a threat to us. And Boris Johnson calls coronavirus the invisible enemy within. You know what I think is the invisible enemy within? Parliament. Parliament and the government. Because the government, the parliament is every bit as bad. Parliament is supposed to exist to hold the government to account. They sit there clapping like seals at everything the government throws at them. No opposition whatsoever. The press then go out and repeat it ad nauseum over and over again. No questions, nothing. Just this is what you have to do. This is a prison state. It is a prison state.